All right, hi there. Uh, welcome to a quick video on section 14.8, Lagrange multipliers. Uh, I do mean this one's gonna be quick and dirty. So let's hit some of the main points. Uh, most of these notes are already completed, although I'll go through a new example at the end of the video. Uh, but for starters, uh, Lagrange multipliers, we're still looking to find maximums or minimums of some function that we're specifically going to be looking at that along some boundary uh, with this uh, with this particular method. So Lagrange multipliers, again, they're going to look for maximums, minimums along boundaries. If we're looking on the interior of some region, uh, we may still need to fall back to the methods we were learning in 14.7, uh, though this new method will still work on the boundary of some region that we might have. So uh, our motivating example, uh, which I've borrowed from Ryan McCombs, uh, we are looking to maximize the volume of some box given a constraint, which is that x squared uh, plus 4xy is equal to 12. That's the maximum amount of material, 12 maybe square feet, a material that we have to build that thing. Uh, and we're looking for the best way to do that. We saw a bunch of stuff in 14.7 uh, where we looked at derivatives, but Lagrange multipliers are going to approach the problem from a slightly different perspective. Uh, so instead of looking at uh, a bunch of separated partial derivatives, uh, we're going to look at the gradients of a pair of functions and notice something unique about the way that they line up at maximums or minimums. Uh, and that's what we've got going on over here with this graph. Uh, the green lines drawn in are different level curves for the volume. Uh, so x times y times z, or x squared times y in this particular case. Uh, multiply those all together, and that gives us our volume. Uh, and we'll notice that with these level curves, the further up and right we go, the larger our volume is, and the smaller uh, left and down we go, uh, smaller our, our volume becomes. Next to that, we're going to plot that red line, which is our constraint equation. That's the amount of material that we have to build this box. And we're gonna look at the gradient of that function as well. Uh, and we find that the maximum value for the volume is going to occur when the gradients of those two functions are parallel. That's why we've got these red and green lines being drawn in here. Uh, red are the parallel or the normal vectors uh, along the red line, green being the normal vectors along the green line. Uh, and we can see that here at the maximal, which is the point that's circled, uh, our gradients are parallel to each other. They line up, uh, but at all other points, those normal vectors will not be parallel. So that's our big idea uh, with Lagrange multipliers. There's one big idea to remember about the geometry and the motivation for this whole section is that we want two normal vectors to be parallel. And the way that we're going to end up writing that out is that the gradient of one function, being gradient of f, is equal to the gradient of another function, probably gradient g, multiplied by some multiplier, by some factor. Uh, and that factor is going to be our Lagrange multiplier, which is where the, the name comes from. Well, I mean, the name comes from the guy that sort of discovered the process, but we're calling it the Lagrange multiplier. Now, it is sort of specific to these sets that our boundary function must be a some function equal to a constant number. And that equality there is important. We're gonna see an example later uh, where we're working with a boundary function that is not specifically equality and how we'll approach that problem instead. Uh, but for the Lagrange multiplier method, we want that boundary function to be equal to a constant. Uh, in this particular case, we only looked at two variables, x and y, uh, but we can also add in uh, a third multiplier going down the line. And then I wrote out a bunch of stuff in my notes here, uh, so work best on problems with a restriction. Uh, again, I want to be comparing this process to solving for a maximum minimum along a boundary instead of just within some region. The Lagrange multipliers specifically work along some kind of boundary. Uh, and then highlighting our big idea again uh, is that gradient of f and gradient of g are parallel. I suppose I should have all of that on the screen at once. And so uh, the steps for solving a Lagrange multiplier problem, I'm going to try to just put it into a process uh, that's actionable. 
uh, these are the four steps I came up with. Uh, we're going to want to use, or we'll find our two. Really hope I hit the mute button before I sneezed there. Uh, find our two gradients uh, and effectively set them equal to each other. One of them gets a lambda multiplier on it. Uh, we're then going to set them equal to each other, which will give us two or three different equations based on you know whether we're using just x and y or x, y, and z. Uh, so two or three different equations comes from the gradient, the two gradients being set equal to each other, and then a fourth equation that just is our boundary equation. So that by the time we're done, we should have a system of three or four equations with just as many variables, uh, x, y, maybe z, and also lambda. So we'll probably use that to find lambda or solve the system in some way. Really, the next few steps are just, here is a system of three to four equations. Do your best to solve it in whatever way seems you know, the, the most logical to you. Uh, and then once we've completely solved our system, that should give us a few points that we can plug back into the original function uh, to find our maximums and minimums. That's going to be our our whole deal. So here go a couple of equations where, again, the process is finding the gradient of f and the gradient of g, and then setting them equal to each other, again, with that lambda multiplier plugged in there. So uh, looking at just my x component, I get 2x is equal to lambda y. And these are the x components of the gradients. Looking at just the y components of my two gradients, I'm here at uh, 2 la 2y two equals lambda x. And finally, bring in my boundary equation back, which was x times y equals 1. That's that part circled in red there. Then I'm going to use those three equations as a system and probably use some amount of substitution to swap them back and forth between each other until I come up with an answer. Uh, so in this particular one, I solved for y in terms of x plugged it into another equation, found my lambda value first, uh, and I found that there were two options for lambda, positive two or negative two, then plugged them back in to find x and y. Uh, so I came up with four possible points here uh, that ended up being uh, the same process, or the same point twice, one, one, and negative one, negative one. Uh, and plugging them in, they both ended up being minimums. So this step over here in blue, so I take the points and plug them back in, see what value I get. Uh, and then because our restriction was unbounded, this particular problem will not have a maximum value. Uh, again, being unbounded. Uh, another similar example. Again, uh, take the gradients multiply one by lambda and set them equal to each other. But the big process, the, the part that ends up being the most intense math part of the problem is solving a system of multiple equations, especially since they don't always work out to be linear. Uh, but with, with this guy up here, uh, I found a couple values for lambda, plugged them in and used that to find my x and y values and ended up with a few points. Uh, because everything was squared in this one, the, uh, I ended up finding that positive or negative one would return the same value. Since plugging things back into f, uh, both x and y get squared immediately. Uh, here we've got another one, this time with z, which means we're going to have a system of four equations. Uh, and this one worked out rather nice that we saw that uh, we could find, I could solve for each of x, y, and z in terms of lambda right away, just from the gradient pieces. Then I was able to plug them into the boundary equation. So now my boundary equation only has lambda in it. I can solve it for lambda and plug it back in to solve for x, y, and z. So, oh, and here was a web work problem uh, that I thought was worth highlighting. Uh, because uh, we missed a minimum value the first time through. Uh, so I wanted to go back through and highlight where that minimum value came from. Uh, so I wanted to go through and solve for my two lambda values. 
This one might have been a, just as simple as uh, dividing by a variable when we weren't supposed to. Yeah, in fact, I think that's exactly what happened uh, when we looked at the work. Uh, so if I just walk through the problem in depth, and I promise I'm going to go over all the steps from scratch in a moment. Uh, but I started with my two gradient equations, partial derivatives after setting them equal to each other. Uh, solved for x squared and y squared in terms of lambda, which let me then plug into the boundary equation uh, and find a couple values for lambda, both uh, positive one half and negative one half. Uh, but there was, I think, an error that we caught here, uh, where the first time solving through, uh, maybe we solved just on the x side, uh, I think we divided an x away immediately and then only got the solution that x is equal to plus or minus one, missing the solution that x equals zero also works. So be careful uh, when you are solving for these x and y variables in some of these equations, uh, especially if there's an x or a y that you can factor completely out. You don't wanna just divide that variable away because if it were equal to zero, like if zero is an allowable option for that variable, you're gonna lose that solution if you divide it away immediately. Better to factor uh, like we've done right here uh, to then end up with a couple of solutions. Both x equals zero and equal, x equals plus or minus one are, are viable solutions. Uh, because, yeah, I think we're coming up with the 1, 1, or negative 1, negative 1, with as many even powers as we had in this problem, the negative values didn't really end up mattering because they all gave the same value when we plugged them in. Uh, but dividing away that x early would have led to missing the solution at 0 and 2 to the 1 fourth for y. Just uh, be a little careful with that. I think this was uh, homework 16, problem 3. Uh, if we look over on the right, it's we get the same two points if we follow our y partials through. Uh, but yeah, then plugging the two in, yep, that's where we found the max. That was the nice point at 1, 1. Uh, but the minimum was missing, again, because uh, that x got factored not the way we would have liked to. All right, and then I promised I would do at least one problem all the way through, although you may regret me making that promise by the time we get to our solutions, uh, but here goes. You just find the extreme values, values being capitalized for no particular reason, of the function 3xy minus y plus 53 on the disk x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. So uh, I mentioned back at the beginning, the Grange multipliers are great on boundaries, but we need to have specifically that our g function is equal to a constant. So on the boundary, uh, x squared plus y squared equals one. Maybe let's put that in red because I feel like we do a lot of this Lagrange stuff in red. At least that was the color I chose. So I'm gonna look specifically in the boundary where x squared plus y squared is equal to one not less than or equal to one. I'll come back and deal with that bit at the end. Uh, but uh, spoiler alert, I'm just gonna use the methods that we looked at in 14.7, where I just take my x, my f partial x and my f partial y, set them both equal to zero and get a regular critical point. Uh, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Let's do the Lagrange multiplier method. So I want gradient of f equal to lambda times the gradient of g, uh, which takes us to a vector equation, which probably ought to say something like uh, 3y is our x partial, and 3x minus 1 is our y partial, and that's equal to lambda times 2x, 2y. I think we've seen that derivative uh, a bunch on several of these problems. Uh, I don't know. We end up using Lagrange multipliers on circles a lot. Uh, but let's set up our, our system. 
which it should say that 3y is equal to lambda times 2x. Uh, our next one, 3x minus 1 is equal to lambda times 2y. Oops. 2x, 2y. I just realized I had a spelling mistake. <laughs> uh, and our third equation should be the boundary equation. x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. And now I have to solve this system of equations. Uh, some series of substitution uh, is going to be helpful, uh, but pretty much all of these Lagrange multiplier problems come down to, here's a system, solve it the best way that you can find. Uh, and that's gonna vary from system to system. Uh, sometimes it's a, there's an easy substitution that you might recognize right away. Uh, other times, uh, maybe requires some stroke of genius to see the specific step you should take. Uh, and so some of this may be a little bit of trial and error as you try to work through the best way to solve through a system. One of those brilliant moments uh, that I think might work out nice here is that I'm going to take my x partials, multiply both sides by y, get 3y squared is equal to lambda times 2xy. Uh, and take the same thing with my y partials, but I'm going to multiply both sides by x. We get 3x squared minus x, and that's equal to 2xy. 2 or lambda 2xy. Lambda to x, y. Keep some of that color going. So my motivation for doing that was noticing that within my first two equations, their right sides looked pretty similar. I had lambda times 2 times x and lambda times 2 times y. So this is almost like getting a common denominator before adding fractions. Uh, but it's like getting a common side before doing substitution, uh, because that will allow me to say that 3y squared must be equal to 3x squared minus x. I'm just going to set their two left sides equal to each other. And now finally, I'm going to substitute in the third equation. If I have three variables and they're all mixed up like this, it'll take all three equations before I can get a solution. And it looks like I'll be solving for x first because it looks like it's the easiest to replace. So I'm going to say that 3 times 1 minus x squared is equal to 3x squared minus x. So the thing I'm doing here is I'm bringing this equation down over here. And now I have a single equation with just one variable in it, so I should be able to get a solution. Uh, though that solution isn't going to work out very nice. But that's okay. Uh, on the right side, which is where I'll move everything, I should have a 6x squared minus x minus 3. After distributing that 3 through and then moving everything to the right side, I get this quadratic equation. And boy, it sure would be nice if that thing factored. Oh well. Let's go to the quadratic formula x is equal to negative negative 1, or positive 1, I've heard it both ways, plus or minus the square root of 1 squared minus 4 times a times c, which will end up being plus 4 times 6 times 3, all over 2a, 2 times 6. Uh, so I've taken the liberty of combining all of my negatives so I don't have to have too many ne double negatives as I write this thing down. Uh, but that minus 4ac, the minus sign out in front, and then the negative 3 end up making that thing positive. Now, this is, of course, everyone's favorite number. 1 plus or minus the square root of 73 all over 12. Uh, yeah, like I said, you might regret that I promised I was going to actually do a whole problem. We have solutions for x now. Uh, hooray for us. So quick check 
uh, on this number, square root of 73. That number is going to be more than 8, but less than 9. So I've got 1 plus or minus 9 over 12, which is still going to be under 1, which is good because we need to be uh, on that on that circle or on that disk that we talked about. Uh, so it's a good thing that this number landed uh, at less than 1. Right, so if it were more than one, we would have found ourselves with a problem. But less than one is good. We can work with that. So I'm going to take uh, those two numbers uh, and bring them back up to the boundary equation and solve for y, aren't I? Yep. I don't know that I like it any more than you do, but let's just give it a crack. Let's see, y squared. Let's give it a shot. I don't know what I said there. Oh, well. Uh, y is going to be equal to 1 minus that mess squared. 1 plus or minus the square root of 73 all over 12. That thing squared. And that means that Y is going to be plus or minus whatever that square root is. Square root of 1 minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 73 over 12 squared. Cool. So I think that means we're going to end up with four solutions that will look like uh, x1, y1, and negative x1. Wait, no, that's not quite right. x1, y1, and x1, negative y1. We'll also have x2, y2, and x2, negative y2. The nice thing about the y values is that that plus or minus is all the way at the end, so the y values are going to look the same, just one being positive and the other being negative. And that's four of our potential critical points are going to be all right there. I'll also uh, include some values for x1 and y1 a little later on. Uh, but it's going to probably be best to just plug that into a calculator and see what we get. So we got some really terrible looking solutions, but they at least are numbers. We can plug them in and get a maximum and minimum from all of those. But there's one final place that we need to check because this is, was all well and good for the Lagrange multiplier set but this was only along the boundary so in addition to the boundary we also need to look inside of the disk also oop, look inside uh, x squared plus y squared is less than one. So we also need solutions in here, which means we're going to need partial derivatives of that function. Uh, so if we write down what f was again real quick, f of xy was 3xy minus y plus 53. Uh, and get some partial derivatives. f partial x was 3y and I need that equal to zero. F partial y was 3x minus 1. I also need that equal to zero. And these come up with some rather nice solutions. y equals zero, and x equals one third. So one third zero, in addition to that collection of four points I got up above. So we will need to check all of these solutions and this solution uh, to see which one to find our maximum and minimum. Nice part about that is though, just the biggest number is the maximum, smallest number is the minimum. So I'm gonna conclude the video here. Uh, and if you wanna see the actual numbers that I ended up getting, I'll include those uh, in the written version of the notes. So cool. I hope you like Lagrange multipliers. Okay, bye. Bye, 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 bye.